Aloha, welcome back to General Pharmacology. Let's move to PowerPoint slides and get started today. <clears throat> today we're going to talk about congestive heart failure uh, and we'll talk about uh, angina as well. So let's get started. Uh, first we're going to talk about congestive heart failure. Congestive heart failure is abbreviated CHF. Uh, that does not stand for Swiss franc. Well, that stands for congestive heart failure. All right, well this is really simple. The heart rate is the number of beats per minute. Anyone knows this. A rate is anything over time and the heart rate is number of beats per minute. So we can take the number of beats times 15 seconds and multiply that by four, or we can count the number of beats over 30 seconds and multiply that by two. But regardless, you guys understand what a heart rate is. It's very, very simple. It's a little more complicated, but it's not really that hard. Stroke volume is the volume of blood that's pumped with each beat. We can't directly measure that, uh, we can assume uh, that it's probably about the number of milliliters that you are kilograms. So in a normal 70 kilogram person, we're going to say it's 70 mils. All right, so stick with a 70 milliliter stroke volume and you'll be fine. All right, heart rate, very simple. Stroke volume, very simple. Heart rate, times stroke volume equals cardiac output. And then once we start using words car like cardiac output, uh, people get real excited because this leads to even more complicated things. So cardiac output is really simple. It's the volume of blood pumped in one minute. Uh, the heart rate is the number of beats per minute. And so the amount of blood pumped each time, uh, it makes sense that those two are multiplied together. About Every minute, uh, every minute you pump over a gallon of blood. That's pretty incredible. Uh, but again, cardiac output is quite simply the stroke volume times the heart rate. If you read big, thick medical books very carefully, uh, the preload is a pressure. And we are, for the simplicity of this class, going to extrapolate the pressure of a normally compliant ventricle into volume. And when we're talking clinically about medications and people in congestive heart failure, uh, it's a lot easier to think about preload in terms of volume. And so that being said, uh, the preload is the volume of blood in the ventricle before the contraction, the end of diastole. And so you'll hear this called the end diastolic volume. I like to just call it the preload. All right, well, after we've had a stroke of the heart and ejected the 70 milliliters, uh, one thing that your heart does not do is completely empty the ventricle with each beat. There's blood left in the ventricle after the contraction, and that is the end systolic volume. And to make things easy, we're just going to call that the afterload. Preload before the stroke, before the beat, after load, after the beat. So the stroke volume again is the volume of blood pumped during a single beat. In this case, if we're using preload as a volume minus the afterload as a volume, then we know our stroke volume. Well, Maybe we want to normalize that. Maybe instead of having a stroke volume, we can have an ejection fraction, and that's the percentage of blood pumped during a single beat. The percentage of blood in the ventricle, the end systolic volume, the, I'm sorry, the end diastolic volume is the preload. The end systolic volume is our afterload. And if we take a percentage of that, then we have the ejection fraction. And if you're going to take care of a patient with congestive heart failure, you're going to want to know what the ejection fraction is. And so we'll CMS the, the people who run Medicare and Medicaid. They're going to insist on knowing the injection fraction of anybody in congestive heart failure. And the ejection fraction is something that we'll figure out when we're doing a cardiac ultrasound. So stroke volume and ejection fraction will be thrown around interchangeably. Again, stroke volume is a direct volume, and ejection fraction is called normalizing it. It's a percentage, and 
When we normalize, what we're doing is we're just accounting for uh, the different sizes and weight. And so think about this. An elephant is great big. It has a great big stroke volume. Uh, a mouse is tiny. Uh, a mouse has a tiny ejection, uh, a tiny stroke volume, but all mammals have an ejection fraction of about 70%. And so that's why we like to use ejection fraction because the ejection fraction is the same in a normal person, whether they're great big or teeny tiny. All right, if you recall from your physics class, a uh, Hooke's Law of Springs. Hooke's Law of Springs is really simple. When you pull on the spring, it pulls back. And if you pull more on the spring, it pulls back more. And if you pull even more on the spring, it's going to pull back even more. And that's Hooke's Law. The more force you deliver into the spring, uh, the more the spring is going to return force in the other direction. So you pull one way, the spring's pulling the other way. This is obvious for those who've ever had anything to do with springs. Well, the same law applies to heart muscles, and that's called the frank starling law of contractility. The more we stretch, the more force is returned. And so for our cartoon, here is a set of weight scales, like at the grocery store. I have this picture. I keep trying to put it in. And uh, you weigh the stuff when the, when the gravity pulls the weight down, the dial starts to change. And so if we took one of those scales and put it on the end of a spring, we could measure the amount of force being delivered to the spring uh, and therefore the amount of force being returned by the spring. And so again, when we stretch the spring, it returns a force in the opposite direction. And the more we stretch it, the more force is returned in the opposite direction. The more stretch, more force. That's Hooke's Law of Springs. That's the Frank Starling Law of Contractility. More stretching results in more force. So again, the Frank Starling Law tells us that the more the heart fills, the stronger the force of contraction. And so over here, this heart, uh, it's not filling with each beat. And so it's contracting a little bit. And this one's getting more full with each beat. So it's returning more force. And this is an important homeostatic mechanism because your return, your cardiac return, the blood volume being returned to the heart is not always consistent from beat to beat. Uh, when you sit in front of a camera and wave your arms and talk, uh, your cardiac return changes with each beat. Uh, when you go and sit up and move around and walk around, the amount of cardiac return, the amount of filling of the heart it's going to change from beat to beat. Sometimes it's a lot of filling, sometimes it's a little bit of filling, and the way your heart deals with this is real simple. More filling, more force. Less filling, less force. This is a normal homeostatic state of the heart. You know, like a normal water pump, it's going to pump a certain amount of water all the time. And with a heart, the more it fills, the more it can pump. With the uh, same thing, the less it fills, the less it needs to pump. So your heart does this automatically, and this is really one of the great homeostatic mechanisms of the heart. So healthy hearts are like a spring. More filling results in more contractile force. We can put this on one of our graphs. I'm, I'm glad we teach you something about Cartesian coordinates in here. Uh, the title of the graph, we're talking about starling curves. Uh, this is more contractility, and this is more... Uh, pre uh, preload in diastolic volume and uh, more filling results in more force. That's the graphical way of describing this. Uh, more filling, more force. All right, great. That's simple enough. By the way, when you read these starling curves in a giant medical book, they're very complicated and so we've made them uh, ridiculously simple for the purposes of PowerPoint because occasionally I get an email uh, that misses the beginning and says, well, well preloads a pressure. And, well, in a normally compliant ventricle, we can extrapolate uh, that as a volume. And so, again, in congestive heart failure, uh, on the Frank Starling curve, my simple Frank Starling curve here, uh, there's a point where more preload results in less force. And this is when we start talking about congestive heart failure. So I showed you the curve before. Uh, this is the green part of the curve where uh, more filling results in more force. However, people can have congestive heart failure and there's a certain part of the curve where more filling results in more force. That's important to remember 
that there is a part of the Starling curve where more filling results in more force. However, they get to a point where more filling does not result in more force. More filling results in less force. And this is our problem with congestive heart failure. That's why we're going to use medications to take away uh, preload. We're going to take medications that take away end diastolic volume. And one of those is Lasix because that that takes away preload and afterload. And so we're going to make the point early on. Normal heart, more filling, more force. Normal, ignoring that right there. Uh, with dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, the heart is thin and weak and floppy. Uh, more filling doesn't result in more force. More filling results in less force. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, more filling, less force. But again, even with people with severe cardiomy dilated cardiomyopathy, there is a part of the curve where uh, more filling does result in more force. It's a very narrow window. And then they get to this point where more filling does result in more force. All right, so congestive heart failure, CHF, is a common, very common debilitating condition. It's just quite simply defined by the heart's mechanical ability to pump. And so if the heart is not pumping in a manner that perfuses the tissues, uh, then this person has congestive heart failure. Uh, so again, normal is more filling, more force. Uh, and so let's take a look at that. Here is the beaker uh, that's supposed to indicate the inside of a ventricle. And when we have end of diastole, uh, we have a normal preload. And then with each stroke, we're ejecting 70% of the volume. So this is a normal cardiac output. This person does not have congestive heart failure. Uh, they have a great cardiac output. They have a great ejection fraction. Let's take somebody with dilated cardiomyopathy. Now we're going to see that they have a low ejection fraction and a low cardiac output because they have a high preload and high afterload. And so in, clini in clinical settings when people talk about preload and afterload, it's really hard to think about what they're talking about. And so here is someone with a high preload. Uh, they have high, they have dilated cardiomyopathy, so their heart's bigger, and so it takes more volume. And so here, uh, we're going to show that as a high preload. And then they all, because the heart is weak and thin and floppy, it's only going to eject in this situation 25% of the volume, uh, leaving us with a very high afterload. And so we want to reduce both preload to improve contractility, and then reduce afterload to improve our ejection fraction and all that goes on at the same time. Um, an ejection fraction of 70% is normal. An ejection fraction of 25% is very low. You're going to be hard pressed to people who hard pressed to find people who can survive with an ejection fraction of less than 25%. All right, well let's take somebody with ventricular hypertension one of the misconceptions is that making muscles bigger is a good thing and that's fine if we're talking about our extremities but the heart muscle uh, when it works harder like due to high blood pressure and ends up hypertrophic uh, it, it's stiff and weak and has less filling and so we'll represent that like this uh, the heart muscles bigger it's not dilated it's exactly the opposite so we would exact expect exactly the opposite to occur that's not the case because the heart's thicker. Uh, it does have a lower, uh, it does have a lower uh, volume, does have a lower afterload, but those pressures are still high and the ejection fraction between them is still 25%. So ventricular hypertrophy, even though it seems like the opposite pathophysiology, still gives us the same result as dilated cardiomyopathy, a congestive heart failure. So you can have congestive heart failure with dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, ventricular hypertrophy, we can have CHF as well. Well, CHF results in a decrease of blood circulation, uh, which then decreases the oxygen supply to the organs and results in fluid accumulation in the tissues. And that fluid accumulation in the tissues is called edema.
So congestive heart failure results in edema. Uh, pulmonary edema, we'll call left-sided failure. Remember, the left side of your heart drains the lungs. Uh, the right side of your heart drains the body. The body is just called the system, and so we'll call that systemic edema. Uh, usually we see that in the legs. Uh, if it's the whole body, we'll call it anasarca. There's all sorts of reasons for anasarca. If our anasarca is due to congestive heart failure, they are definitely at the end stage of congestive heart failure, but I wanted you to be familiar with uh, the term anasarca. All right, one of the types of edema we can have is pitting edema of the feet, and when the feet are in the dependent position, and so if you spend time uh, with your heart higher off the ground than your feet, then the blood flows downhill, uh, the fluid flows downhill, and so we'll see mild pitting edema, well, we'll see pitting of the we'll see pitting edema of the feet in congestive heart failure. And they'll show you how to uh, examine this as one plus or two plus. Uh, however, um, what I want you to know is congestive heart failure results in this pitting edema. And you, when they call it pitting because after uh, you put your thumbprint uh, on their, after you put your thumb under your foot, uh, on their foot to show the pitting, you take the thumb away and that pit remains. And if it's severe, you can even see your thumbprint on their skin because that outer layer is not very tightly connected to the inner layer and there can get fluid in between them and you know that from things like blisters. So anyway, they'll show you how to rate this from 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus, 4 plus depending on uh, how high up the pitting edema is in their legs. All right, so pitting edema is due to failure of the right side to properly drain the body, the right side of the heart. Um, the left side is responsible for draining the lungs and pumping to the body. And if we list, listen to somebody who has pulmonary edema, if it's very mild, we'll hear crackles. The crackles are the sounds of the alveoli opening and shutting. And since they're a little more wet, uh, they have the snap, crackle, pop sound to them. And so if you've ever eaten uh, Rice Krispies uh, and listen to the snap, crackle, and pop, that's exactly what pulm uh, pulmonary edema sounds like uh, crackles in early congestive heart failure. However, you're only going to hear the crackles in the dependent parts of the lungs. And so uh, here she is listening to uh, these crackles in the bases of his lungs. You're not going to hear crackles in the bases of the lung if the patient is laying down. All right, the person has to be upright for you to hear crackles in the bases. Uh, because if they're laying down, uh, their crackles aren't in the bases, their crackles are going to be underneath in the dependent position. And so when I read things from students who examine somebody laying down, uh, saying they have crackles in the bases of their lungs, uh, remember, they need to be sitting up to have uh, those crackles. And again, that's fluid collection in the lower part of the lungs. Uh, the worse the uh, congestive heart failure is, the higher up you'll hear the crackles. Uh, and then the more, uh, the more congestive heart failure they have, the more pulmonary edema they have, the more their breath sounds will sound uh, like uh, a fish tank. Usually we see both. For this course, I don't need you to know the difference between right-sided failure and left-sided failure. I just need you to know the congestive heart failure uh, results in uh, is the inability for the heart to pump mechanically and it results in pulmonary edema and uh, edema in dependent portions of our feet. A long time ago, they came up with the New York Heart Association classification of congestive heart failure, and despite this being nearly 100-year-old nomenclature, I still see it used, and so we'll go through it. Um, class 1 congestive heart failure uh, is no limitation of physical activity. I call this asymptomatic, very mild. Uh, so we'll start with class 2. I'll ask you from class 2 to class 4. We'll go to class 4 and start there. Uh, they have symptoms at rest. This is what you need to know about in-stage congestive heart failure. Class 4 congestive heart failure means they have symptoms at rest. And if they get up and do anything, uh, they basically can't because they have cardiac insufficiency. All right, so class 4 symptoms at rest. If they sit still and it goes away, it's not class 4. If they have symptoms at rest and they don't go away, uh, that's end-stage congestive heart failure. That's 
uh, class four severe. All right, we'll switch back between two and three because this is a subjective determination between mild and moderate. If it's mild, it's two. If it's moderate, it's three. Uh, but the difference is when they get up and move around, they have congestive heart failure symptoms, but if they rest, it will go away. So class two and class three are both characterized by comfortable at rest. The only difference is, is their limitation of physical activity uh, due to the congestive heart failure, moderate or mild. And so if you can remember it that way, uh, it'll be easier to remember than one is this paragraph and two is that paragraph because uh, that's not what I need you to memorize. I need you to remember that class two and class three are limitations of physical activity uh, between moderate and mild, uh, but they are comfortable at rest, and then class four, they're, they're symptomatic at rest regardless. We've talked about most of these drugs already, ACE inhibitors, calcium channel blockers, angiotensin receptor blockers, beta blockers, diuretics. So here, ACE inhibitors are essential for treating congestive heart failure, even if they don't have high blood pressure. And so you'll take care of a congestive heart failure patient. Maybe you'll start them on ACE inhibitors and then they'll read, oh, wait a minute, well, this is an antihypertensive. You didn't say anything about me having high blood pressure. And so, well, we talked about using ACE inhibitors to prevent congestive heart failure or to treat, and, uh, to treat congestive heart failure to, to, to treat and prevent the symptoms. Uh, and so we have to be very careful about our patients going out and finding their own medical, uh, medical information and using books that have a therapeutic class that say, oh, well, ACE inhibitors, they're antihypertensives. And that doesn't make sense because we can also use them in congestive heart failure even if they don't have uh, high blood pressure. And that goes for all of these medications. Uh, something else we can use, uh, by the way, I wanted to add in, since that's not on the uh, last slide, uh, ACE inhibitors we can use in anyone. You can write that anyone. Um, angiotensin receptor blockers, you can use that in anyone with congestive heart failure. Uh, diuretics, we'll use those in anybody with congestive heart failure. Mostly Lasix or potassium sparing diuretics. We use mostly thiazides for high blood pressure, and we talked about that in the last lecture. The two things I wanted to point out is calcium channel blockers and beta blockers. We don't want to use these in end-stage congestive heart failure, and so you can make a little note out to the side. Uh, these are fine for class two and three. Beta blockers are fine for class two and three, but beta blockers and calcium channel blockers we will not use in end-stage congestive heart failure uh, because they will decrease cardiac output uh, in the later stages. Early on, uh, the beta blockers help perfuse the muscles, decrease oxygen consumption, which does help the heart function. Something that we'll see about ACE inhibitors is this scarring of the cardiac muscling. They'll call it remodeling. Uh, when you remodel a condo, that's a good thing. When the heart remodels, that's not a good thing. Uh, the heart was designed perfectly the first time, and so then when it scars and rebuilds itself, uh, we don't want that. And so ACE inhibitors prevent the scarring of the uh, cardiac muscle, especially after um, uh, myocardial infarction that leads to congestive heart failure. All right, well, somebody with end-stage congestive heart failure uh, who's uncomfortable at rest and even minimal activity causes them discomfort, maybe we'll bring them into the clinic and give them an IV. And one of the IVs that we'll see used is NatriCore, uh, and it is a non-adrenergic vasodilator. Uh, it's based on uh, the natriuretic peptide system in your body. Uh, we'll come to that eventually. Uh, before that, there was IV dobutamine. We still see that used in certain situations. Dibutamine is basically a synthetic form of dopamine, has a little bit different action. That's why it's called an adrenergic agonist. And so we'll use IV, uh, IV dobutamine to increase contractility of the heart and treat congestive heart failure. And so somebody has congestive heart failure, maybe they come into the clinic uh, once every few weeks for an IV treatment of dobutamine or an IV treatment of NatriCore. And it will improve their cardiac function for quite a while. And so be on the lookout for people who come to the clinic uh, get an IV of NatriCore to improve their congestive heart failure uh, so they can get through the next couple of weeks without so much discomfort. If you read the old books on digoxin, they'll talk about it being as positive inotrope, increasing in contractility of the heart. Uh, 
Uh, now we use it mostly for atrial fibrillation. Uh, these are great. Uh, this is a great drug that is a positive inotrope, dobutamine. Uh, in NatureCore, it has a very interesting way of working. It's primarily a vasodilator. Uh, digoxin is also a positive inotrope. And again, in the old days, it was described as a drug for congestive heart failure, but now we use it mostly in atrial fibrillation. Uh, I don't need to know, I don't need you guys to know all this action on sodium potassium pumps and slow calcium. I don't need any of that. Uh, what I do want you to know is that digoxin is cardiotoxic with hypokalemia. And so a lot of people in congestive heart failure will take Lasix, which causes us to lose potassium. And then in combination with digoxin, uh, it can be very, uh, very detrimental. So we have to follow the potassium levels in our patients very carefully when they are on digoxin and Lasix. And even though we use it in atrial fibrillation, uh, because it remains a positive inotrope, uh, regardless of the changes in the books, the drug is exactly the same as it's always been. Be careful about that in medicine. You know, for years this was a positive inotrope, and they're like, oh, well, now it's, now it's this over here. I'm like, well, you can change the books and the definitions, but the drug never changed at all. And so a lot of people with congestive heart failure have atrial fibrillation, so when we put them on digoxin to control their atrial fibrillation, uh, we do get the other a benefit of uh, digoxin being a positive inotrope, increasing the force of contraction of the heart. We've known this for a very long time. The foxglove plant is where digitalis comes from. Digitalis, the active ingredient in digoxin. And uh, uh, we've been using foxglove to treat uh, thumping feelings in the chest uh, throughout history. Uh, digoxin has some very interesting uh, effects when uh, toxicity occurs. Uh, one of the uh, one common complaint is yellow vision. People who are digitoxic, they'll explain. It'll seem like they are wearing these yellow sunglasses when they look out on the world. Uh, very rarely we'll come across people with green sunglasses when they have uh, digitoxicity. Somewhere in between yellow green. Uh, yellow vision is what we see mostly with digitoxicity, and so that's what they'll ask you. They'll, is it yellow vision? Yes. And then if you see green vision, we can add that too. Uh, but it's predominantly yellow vision that we see with digi digitoxicity. All right, well, I'm teaching this EKG course, an EKG technician course, and having a lot of fun with that. And so we throw this slide in, digitoxicity on an EKG. Uh, we'll see a downsloping of the ST segment, and um, we'll talk about all of this, what this means, in the next lecture, uh, and we'll probably cover this again. Uh, but I thought this was interesting. We see this characteristic uh, sagging of the T wave. This ST segment seems to sag uh, before it goes back up, and so they'll see that downsloping ST segment depression uh, with what they call a reverse tick or a Salvador Dali sagging appearance. It's interesting I hear the Salvador Dali. Sometimes I hear it called a, Sal a Salvador Dali mustache appearance, and sometimes I hear the sagging appearance, as if anybody has any idea who Salvador Dali is. Uh, flattening inverted biphasic T waves. That's what we see, biphasic T wave down, T wave up. Uh, there's a little TU wave there. I don't need you to know that. Uh, but we can take a look at these. If you're going to be an expert, uh, you want to email me and, and take this EKG course uh, that I'm teaching. Uh, or you can memorize these things right here. By the way, since I was on the subject, all right, so this is Salvador Dali, and he is a famous artist, famous enough to at least me talk about him. And this is where the sagging appearance came from. He drew something very famous, and uh, you notice everything is sagging. And then he has, the, he always had these funny looking mustache shapes. If you look at pictures of Salvador Dali, uh, his mustache was very interesting. And so that's where all this Salvador Dali sagging mustache business comes from. And if you see it on a question, just remember, oh, well, that's, that's digitoxicity. Uh, what's more important is this yellow vision, okay? Because patients will tell you about this. Uh, it'll be EKGs uh, that have these weird uh, biphasic T waves that look like, oh, that's, there's his mustache right there, maybe. Right. So that's where that comes from. Uh, angina means chest pain, and we use it in cases 
uh, where the angina uh, is, we talk about angina in terms of chest pain due to a coronary occlusion due to uh, atherosclerosis, coronary artery disease. And so the coronary arteries supplying the heart become narrowed over time and the narrowed arteries limit the amount of blood being supplied to the heart, especially during strenuous activity. When you're doing strenuous things, well, the heart needs more blood. And if there's a blockage, you'll notice that with pain, angina, with increased strenuous activity. And so you'll see a lot of people with angina, if they have stable angina, they exercise their chest or heart. And then once they rest, the chest pain goes away. And so I want you to know the difference between stable and unstable angina. This is very important because you'll take care of people who have stable angina. It's very predictable and it's directly related to the amount of exertion. It does not occur at rest. All right? That's the important thing about stable angina. The more they exercise, the more they, the more they exert themselves, the more they have chest pain. The more they relax, the more it goes away. And they can sit and rest long enough for the chest pain to go away entirely. And so there are some people that this is their optimal situation. This is the best that we can do with them. And you'll see a lot of elderly people who have stable angina. And if they get up and overexert themselves, they start feeling that pressure in their chest and they sit down and rest, it goes away. So that's stable angina. Unstable angina is unpredictable. It's not directly related to the amount of exertion. Maybe they're just sitting there at rest and then all of a sudden, <gasps> Uh, they feel pressure in their chest. Oh, well, that's unstable angina. In my world, I consider that to be equivalent to a heart attack, and they need to be treated like a heart attack until you find some cardiologist who is comfortable with the state of their unstable angina and then has maximized the amount of therapy that we can do with that. So these are the two real anginas right here, stable and unstable. And both of these are due to coronary artery disease. Unfortunately, there must have been some prince in metal land, prince metal, prince metal's angina, that was his name. It's caused by spasming of the arteries, so it doesn't have to do with atherosclerosis. Sometimes for that we'll use uh, calcium channel blockers. Uh, when you get uh, knee deep in the cardiolo uh, cardiology business, uh, you will come across people who have prince metals and uh, atherosclerotic angina. We won't get into all of that. Uh, but I want you to separate this Prinzmetals business uh, from stable and unstable. Know the difference between unstable and st stable and unstable. All right, so all this is due to coronary artery disease due to atherosclerosis. And we've done everything we can. We've had better diet. We've exercised. We've tried to stop smoking. We've stopped smoking. We stopped smoking a long time ago. Uh, control hypertension, uh, lower LDLs. Uh, raise HDLs, lower triglycerides. Right, so we've done everything we can. Uh, but we're still going to need medications to treat angina. And again, when you're on a college campus or you're hanging around a bunch of healthy people, uh, you look at the healthcare center systems and their medical recommendations and you think, oh, well, that's way too much medication and nobody really needs to do that. Well, you sit in front of the emergency room doors, especially in a big city, and you have person after person after person after person after person rolling through the door having a heart attack and if it's a Saturday night uh, not only are the heart attacks rolling through the door uh, but something we used to call the knife and gun club the, the people who are violent on the weekends at night all that trauma would come through the door and you realize uh, that there's a real crisis going on not only with violence which we know all about uh, but there's a crisis going on with coronary artery disease as well. And uh, the people who are working in our emergency rooms are being worked to death uh, because people really don't understand uh, what it is that we do and what needs to be done. And so it's important that we take care of these people while they're feeling okay, uh, but they tend to want to wait until they're in an emergency room and at very high risk of bad outcome. And so despite a better diet, more exercise, stop smoking, control hypertension, lowering LDL and HDL, uh, raising HDL and triglycerides and reading all sorts of books uh, talking about how uh, we'd all be better off if, if doctors weren't around. Um, that's not the case. And so this isn't always going to work for everybody. And you want to see that in motion, go stand in front of an emergency room door or behind it. 
uh, as a healthcare worker. At the time I did it, it was a complete privilege. It was nice to see. It was a beautiful thing to be on the front row of the truth of what's really going on with humanity. All right, back to our regularly scheduled program. Uh, we're going to use nitrates to treat angina. Now, we've used nitrates already to treat malignant hypertension because it is an uh, intensive vasodilator. By dilating the vascular vessels, we lower blood pressure, and by making the blood vessels bigger, uh, we can allow more blood to flow to the heart. And this relaxes the smooth muscle, not only in the heart, but around the blood vessels. All right, so the nitrates increase coronary blood flow by dilating coronary arteries, improving, improving blood flow to ischemic regions. Again, ischemia means that the heart, the tissue is not getting enough blood supply, but it is reversible. Uh, you do need to know that when you give somebody nitroglycerin, that it's going to drop their blood pressure precipitously. That means by a lot. And so if they are in the emergency room for the very first time getting nitroglycerin, it might be a good idea for them to be seated uh, before you give them the nitroglycerin, have an IV access before you give them the nitroglycerin, uh, because this can happen right here, a complete dropping of their blood pressure. And so I've seen people come into the emergency room and they're having chest pain and somebody wants to give them nitroglycerin before that person's even parked and they give them nitroglycerin and then we have a hypotensive crisis on our hands. And hypotension in the face of restricted coronary blood flow it only makes things worse. So we have to be careful about uh, using this, making sure, especially in an emergency room, when we're giving it for the very first time. Uh, sublingual nitroglycerin, there's plenty of people who out, out there who use it regularly. They still need to be seated in a comfortable position, uh, not standing up walking around when we give them the nitroglycerin. All right, something else the nitroglycerin does is decrease left ventricular end diastolic pressure and left ventricular end diastolic volume preload. I cut and paste that from something, so I'm not the only person who uses uh, preload as a volume, not necessarily a pressure. Uh, but now this should make a little bit of sense to you. End diastolic pressure, that's the, uh, the end, di end diastolic pressure that, and the end diastolic volume, that's the amount of blood in the heart uh, before it pumps. And so, uh, the nitroglycerin helps cardiac function in this way as well. There's all sorts of different ways to uh, administer nitroglycerin in your clinical discussion uh, section. Uh, in the clinical discussion handout for this chapter, there's all sorts of interesting things about nitroglycerin IV. Uh, there are nitroglycerin tablets that we can take on a regular basis uh, to prevent angina. However, you'll hear people talk about needing a break from that instead of just using it on a regular basis. They'll take the nitroglycerin orally for a while and then stop it. And those are the uh, stop it for a day and then resume it. And those are the preventative ways to, I'm sorry, the, the, there are tablets and I wish these were on my slides. Oh, they're in your clinical discussion section. Uh, but we'll talk about this right here. Um, there's this thing called sublingual nitroglycerin. And that goes under the tongue. Um, the way, reason it goes under the tongue is it avoids the first pass effect and results in better bioavailability. So the important thing here is not to swallow the sublingual nitroglycerin. Uh, swallowing the sublingual nitroglycerin uh, will prevent the nitroglycerin from being, uh, prevent its bioavailability because it undergoes the first pass effect. So do not swallow the sublingual nitroglycerin. So sometimes you'll see nitroglycerin available as a spray and that goes under the tongue. Again, there's other forms of nitroglycerin. We'll use IV in an acute situation. I know in your uh, clinical discussion handout there is something about nitroprusside and why we check on cyanide levels if somebody's been on nitroprusside IV for a while. There's also in your clinical discussion um, preventative nitroglycerins um, that uh, are available as a patch and a pill uh, that people don't take while they're having uh, uh, while they're having chest pain. We'll give sub sublingual nitroglycerin to somebody while they're having angina, uh, and then there are oral forms of nitroglycerin that we'll use on a regular basis uh, to prevent the angina. So make sure you know the difference between those three things.